Hi, the Magna Dales. Yes, we are. Hi. Yeah. Well, yeah, come in, come in, come in. So you're 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 looking for a new place? We've been looking for long. Oh, you know, not that long. Oh well, I think your search is probably about to end right here. Okay, well, come on in. As you'll see, the uh, the lounge here is quite spacious, quite a large amount of space, and very roomy. Lots of lots of room for a family to grow, maybe. Mm. Oh yeah, there's a lot of space in here. This is. Bigger than I thought it was. Yes. Oh, oh, this isn't the half of it. Oh, this isn't the half of it. Let me show you. Let's show you around. This is the kitchen here. Obviously, you got a, a fully fitted uh, kitchen there. A decent amount of space. I think you'll agree. Oh, yeah. Huh. Yes. Uh, down the hall here, we have a downstairs WC, a dining room. Uh, yeah, yeah, very convenient. Yes, and um, then of course we'll head up the stairs. Oh! Huh. Hmm. Uh, so, sorry. What? 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 It was that? Oh, it's just the air raid siren. Don't worry. Don't worry. It means that you will get a chance to look around the other side of the property. Wait. What? Well, I mean, obviously now you'll see the the walls peeling away, floating away into the the ether. You'll notice that there seems to be a lot more rust along the sides here now, and even the the whole yeah. chicken wire fence where the uh, partition wall into the living room used to be. Yeah. Now, this, do you mind your head here on the the swinging, screaming corpse uh, in a bag? Maybe a corpse. Who can say? I didn't say corpse. Anyway, do you mind your head on that as you come up sure the you stairs? Did say here? Corpse. No, no, don't worry. It's probably just treacle that's dripping out of there. Come on, up you come mm -hmm. now. Uh huh. Now you might be able to see that you can can see a lot further out here than you you could on the way. In, yes? Yes. Yes, and then, but obviously, you've got a good open view of the sky here, which is, uh, um, well, it's pitch black, obviously. Yeah, but it, yeah. but the, the void does go on for quite a considerable time. And yeah, yeah. From up here, you can see the, uh, strange, uh, maybe bat like creatures, and uh, obviously, uh, the, uh, denizens down there. Shuffling around in the... Uh... I mean, Denison's is not what I was anticipating today. Mm. Well, it'll probably end soon, don't worry. And then we can just uh, head back and look around the, the upstairs area from the uh, other world. I'm sorry, what's going on? Oh, well, you know, this uh, this property exists within sort of a weird, uh, maybe cursed space. It sort of occasionally flits between one place and the other. There's, there's probably some kind of curse on the entire town, but... As you'll remember from the uh, property listing, that uh, you won't be able to find anything else in this area for any less. I mean, it is literally the only place that says they'll they'll let me have a cat. Uh, I guess this is it. Welcome to Silent Hill. You'll be one of us now. Yay! Greetings, strangers, queer and pleasant. I'm not Laura Kate Magnetdale. And I'm not Jane Harris Magnetdale. And welcome to another episode of Queer and Pleasant Strangers. It's a podcast for two queer trans women. That's us. We're wifey types. We yeah. done did a marriage on each We've other. We've got a cat. You've got a cat. She's, she's, she's on your lap. Set, settling down for a bit. She is. Uh, we talk about the things we've consumed media-wise in the week and do silly voices and skits and just have a bit of a catch-up and a giggle mm. with each other, try and make each other have a little, a little laugh. A little jokey. How are you doing? How am I doing? Um, well, I'm going to warn everyone right up front that I uh, ruined my voice over the weekend by slightly raising my voice How dare and you? enunciating loudly for a good 10-15 yeah. minutes. How dare you go to a room where communication was needed and slightly talk from one room to another yeah. and... Oh, how dare you? And then barely be able to speak for two days and it's only been like two days since then that um, I I've had to rest, so... If we get halfway through Brushful Justice Warriors at the very end, <laughs> in fact, if we make it that far, I'll be impressed, and, and it goes a bit wonky in the voice department, mm. I apologise in advance. Well, I'm a, I'm a sleepy bean, because I announced a thing last week that has been a lot of my energy has been keeping on top of, mm -hmm. and also got tattoos done, which means my body has spent a few days just going, 
I need to fix myself. Yeah. You got, I got stabbed a lot of times. You did, you got you stabbed multiple times, but you have cool new tattoos. Yeah, it's been like four hours getting getting stabbed with tiny needles, and now yeah. I've got new colours in you my got skin. Three new, three new tattoos? Yeah, I did. It's been like three plus years since I last got tattooed, so I was like, ah, fuck it, make up for lost time. Squeeze them in. Yeah. Yeah. What? What have you been playing this week? Oh, do we want to talk about the escape room? I mean, that that seems like a sensible place to start. Since we mentioned it. Yeah. So we went to uh, Marvo Escape Room yes. in uh, uh, Bournemouth. Yes. Uh, so this is a like a single location escape room in Bournemouth that uh, has very, very good reviews. And um, I can see why. Yeah, like I, I was looking for escape rooms that were in Bournemouth and like <laughs> looking through a list. And this one kept popping up as like, not only the best one in Bournemouth, but, like, one of the best ones around. Uh, like, almost exclusively five-star reviews. A lot of reviews from people who review a lot of escape rooms going, this one's real good. Uh, so we gave it a go. We went along with my parents. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was their first escape room ever. Yes. Uh, it was a really fun one. It really was. Um, like, obviously not going into into spoilers about, like, puzzles or later stage theming, because, you know... In case anyone happens to go do this escape room, but the but the general idea that like even the fact that you when you get your like invite email uh, yeah. having signed up for it, it's like you're gonna have to follow these instructions to yeah. get into the they, building. They start the theming before you're even in the building with like, okay, on the side of the building you're gonna see uh, a big a big thing on the side of the wall. You've got to do this and follow these instructions, and there'll be a gate. And when the thing happens, you go through and. Like, they get you feeling in the theme before you're even in the building, which yeah. I thought was good. But the the general gist, which I think they talk about on the website, is MARVO is, uh, I forget what the acronym stands for, but it's about collecting um, strange magical artifacts from around the world, and mm -hmm. your sort of lobby is this fascinating room of, like, handmade prop artifacts. Yes. Um, I don't know if any of them are purchased or if they're entirely handmade. My but... understanding is they're all handmade, even the ones that are replicas of other things. That's amazing. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a mismatch, a mix match of, like, completely original stuff and, like, oh, that's a handmade replica of that thing I know from that thing. Yeah, sci-fi, fantasy... There's maps all over the walls from various um, fantasy yeah. series. I recognised a bunch of them. Yeah. Like I spotted Narnia and the map to the Lonely Mountain from The Hobbit and the map of Middle-earth from Lord yeah. of the Rings. Uh, the member of staff who was working there, who was sort of uh, doing the, the, the setup and introduction in character as a member of this Bobby was organization. Great. Bobby was fantastic. Yeah. Very high energy, but like very... Like... Did not seem gr uh, uh, jaded by having done the spiel that yes, many times. I it imagine you'd have to have done that a lot. Yeah. Considering that's like six years of... Yeah, thing. really, really... I would guess you probably, like, change it a little bit over yeah, time to very, keep yourself entertained. Very, very good energy. Very good at getting you sort of in the, the energy for going in. Oh, yes. Um, we did this as a group of four with two people who'd never done an escape room before and two people who had. Yep. And... You've done a bunch at this uh, point, I've right? done a fair few at this point. Uh, we got through in, like, 54 minutes out of the hour, I think. About. So, like, we had a couple of hints along the way, but I think that the, the person running the room did a good job of not doling out stronger hints than were needed, mm -hmm. or more frequently than were needed. It was just yeah. enough of a nudge to go, you are circling a thing, just point you back on track slightly. Yeah. And it was, you know, we I've, I've known this with um, escape rooms before. If if you seem to have ground to a bit of a halt, they will give you a bit of a nudge yeah. with either like a, a message but, on a screen or even like yeah. a little bit of. They they, ba they balanced it well, I think. To it never felt like oh I I almost had it and you you spoiled it. It was mm -hmm. we've clearly missed some element of what's going on that's right in front of our face and just a little nudge will get us there. Yes. Um. But yeah, I liked a lot of the puzzle theming in this. Mm -hmm. It uh, there, there was a there was a phase. I'm going to say like maybe a third of the way in, where like suddenly we had a lot of extra options open to us, and oh, yes. we it t definitely took us a minute to get our bearings. With like we suddenly have a bunch of new options, and yes. it's a little overwhelming. But once we got over that hurdle, like everything pretty logically connected, mm -hmm. and I think that. A lot of the puzzles that were there felt very satisfying when they did click. It was not a moment of like... 
there were very few, oh, that's bullshit, how are we supposed to work that out? And it was mm-hmm. a lot more like, oh, I feel very smart for suddenly having got what that was. Oh, yeah. yeah Lots of just, like, things you need to observe, like... Tying things together, and your dad was getting quite into it with, like, there's this, this is pattern, I've seen this pattern elsewhere. It's like, yes. Yeah. There was a lot of really fun stuff with, like, you'd get parts of a puzzle early on before you could complete it, mm-hmm. and there was enough time built into the hour to go, ooh, I have these two things, maybe this is a solution, and to go down the wrong tree for a second and go, okay, we clearly don't have enough to solve this, and then come mm-hmm. back to it later and go, oh, I see the missing piece, and yeah. what we do with this now. It... As a bit of a lock yeah. nerd, I enjoyed the fact there were oh, lots of really nice locks. The locks were so nice. They had such good, tangible locks of so many kinds. Good weight, um, and just some really unique keyways yeah. that I've not seen before. I appreciate their incorporation of anti-temper locks and explaining how those work, so that, mm-hmm. like, it really did reinforce this, I have, I have uh, put the wrong answer in and need to just, like, reset and try again, rather than, like... Maybe I've got the right thing in, and I'll just like jiggle it about a bit. Mm-hmm. It it forced you to be like to to, to be confident in your answers you input yeah. a bit. I liked the sort of like dramatic theming and tone and escalation toward the end. Yeah. There there was stuff that was like tied different puzzles together. Yeah, like there was something we did quite early on, within about the first fifteen minutes, that tied to something we needed to right at the very end. Yes. Yeah, there was a lot of, like, just because you've moved on from a puzzle, like, a an element that solved one puzzle doesn't mean that element will no longer be important. Mm-hmm. Even though, you know, your keys, once they're done, are done. Yeah, and I appreciate, just for clarity's sake, that, like, generally the keys were labelled. Yes. So, like, if you find a key, it is very clear what it's supposed to go to. Mm-hmm. Just, just so that you're not, like, trying a key in every lock just in case. It's like, yes. you found the key... If you can see, if you know where the lock is, you know first try, I've put the right ones together. Yeah. Yeah. Very good job of keeping, like, the tone and immersion mm-hmm. right to the end very dramatic. Yep. Amazing set, sets, beautiful props. Yeah. Like, my only... Clean. I think my only complaint would be, in the latter half, there is an element where some dialogue is conveyed, where... Because of some audiovisual elements going on, I found it hard at times to follow what was being said. Mm. And I understand thematically, but I could have done with a little more clarity. More subtitles, um, please. Honestly, yeah. I, I, <laughs> I don't care about Im- immersion. Subtitles or reduce the uh, elements that aren't the dialogue so I can hear it more clearly. Yes. But we had a very good time, and I think my parents had a good time, yes. despite being... Considering this was their first escape room, there was a little bit of like, ah, there's so many options. What do mm. what do I do? I think they might be a bit spoiled now. <laughs> I, yeah, they've de- they've definitely like gone in on a good one first. Oh yeah. Um, we've set <laughs> them up, anything we've, up to it. We've set them up with a with a high expectation. <laughs> yeah. But we got them at some point in the past. I think it might be for uh, Mother's Day or something. I got them a escape room in a box. Uh, one, one of the, of the exit, exit boxes, one of the exit yeah. boxes. And I'm hoping that having enjoyed this, they'll give that a try. I hope so. And that'll get them in that rhythm of, yeah, I like these sort of th- th- puzzle environmenty things. Yeah, because there was one puzzle that was just fascinatingly designed that had elements that reminded me of stuff I had seen in that sort of puzzle before. Right, yeah. Because um, I, without even looking at the other side of the room while I was shouting codes, yes, I was like, I can tell what's happening behind me because I know exactly this sort of puzzle, but it's so clever and so well was done. Was that that one near the start? Yes. Yes, the one with the string. Yes. Yes, that very much felt like the kind of thing that would be in something like an exit box. Maybe but- not, like... In, like done in that way, but yeah. that concept of we are drawing like a dot to dot or lines in a certain yes. way, and that's that's making giving us an appear. answer for something. But yes. that was a really nice tactile one to start with because like Mum was doing the tactile element of that, and she was getting so excited every time. It's like, oh, I can see what that what that's doing. Yeah, it was a nice like you can see the progress you're making as you make it kind mm-hmm. of puzzle. Um, but yeah. Uh, as someone who's done a reasonable number of escape rooms, this one's real good. Yeah. It was very solidly made. Everything was like, everything worked exactly as it should have done. There was no signs of like wear or tear on anything. Yeah. It was 
immaculately uh, yeah. handled. It was clean. It was. It was. It was nice. Yeah. Um, nothing. Nothing wobbled too much. Yeah. If if you are a UK based person that likes escape rooms and happen to be near Bournemouth, Marvo yep, definitely, definitely gets a definitely gets a sort of thumbs up. Oh hell yes. Yeah. Yeah. I almost want to go back because I forgot my phone, which was annoying. <laughs> I would have liked to take more pictures of the lobby. Um, like I almost like the idea of maybe going back and just. Taking some time to just take in that room without yeah. having to, like, worry about answering all of the uh, puzzles. Right. Like, there's a part of me that's like, I want to take these puzzles in a slightly less frantic way. Right. Like, I'd be up for redoing it with you and going, we've done, like, just being open and being like, we've done this room before, but we we just want to take our time with it. We just, get in. We just want to appreciate it. Yeah. We're not here to speed run it. <laughs> But yeah, uh, that was great. Also, the music. The, there was some nice, um, especially in the first room, uh, like ambient music being played while we had that uh, initial intro. <laughs> yes. And then we had some good, like, dramatic music. Some good dramatic sound design throughout. Occurring. Yeah. We, we had some good sort of uh, music that didn't seem at any point to be too repetitive. There were a couple of times where we were trying to shout things, especially after I'd already started to lose yes. my voice, when I did wish it was a little bit more quiet. But apart from that, yeah. could not argue. Yeah, it's it, it was a real good one. And I will say no more because, like, yeah, the, the less you know about a good escape room going in, the better. Oh, yes. Um, I think the only other things I would say is, like, it is... Uh, it is. I wouldn't say it's like too di- too difficult on the puzzle scale. Like it's not an impossibly hard. We're trying. We to didn't make find you- it too difficult. But apparently, it's only got a forty three percent success yeah. rate. Uh, but yeah, it it feels like it feels like a room that wants you to succeed yeah. difficulty wise. And it's most not, most of them do. It's not needlessly spooky. Is the other thing I'll say. Like I think it has a couple of like a couple of little moments, but it's not like. Um, it's Disney spooky. It's yes. not. My my mum was spooky. describing a relative of ours who recently did one where it involved like, oop, there was someone in the room that you didn't know about and put a hand on your shoulder and someone set off a chainsaw and ah, everything got scary. Yeah. It's not that level. It's 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 the kind of thing that's like not gonna. If if you brought like a a, a young a, a youngish person along, they're not gonna get nightmares about no. it or anything. Um, yeah. yeah. Should we talk about other things we've played talk this about week? Other, what, what are some other things that you played this week, Age um, of Calamity, I'm guessing? <laughs> well, we'll get to that in a second. Should okay. we talk about the other things we played with my parents? Yeah, or we with, talk about with Azul. Mom? Yeah, so we played... Uh, was this just the first this was Azul? The first one, this was just Azul. Yes, which I've never played before. Mm-hmm. Um, have you Have you played this, or was it no. just... You're um, aware of it. I was aware of this. Um, so by the time I was... Looking to get an Azul. Yes. Summer Pavilion was already out, and the reviews I had seen were saying Summer Pavilion is everything Azul was, but it's just a more refined system, and in multiple reviewers' opinions, it was just a better yeah. iteration on on that concept. Yeah, so for anyone who's like, we've mentioned the Azul games before on here, uh, it is a, I think, currently a trilogy of... Quadrilogy? Uh, okay, quadrilogy of board games that all share one core element in uh, between them, which is there is sort of a drafting system of tokens from the middle, where generally uh, you can take all the, the pieces of a single colour and the rest go in the middle and create a new pool that you can pull from. That's the basic mechanic that all of them share in some regard. Uh, but then what you do with the drafted materials kind of changes from game to game. Um, regular Azul is about trying to fill out a... Mosaic. Uh, a mosaic, which is a sort of... It's it's a square board made up of smaller squares, and putting a square down next to a square that's already placed is worth more points than placing a square just by itself. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, the top row is the easiest one to put uh, squares in. You only have to put one square of a colour to... To fill in a bit of the board down the bottom, it's harder to do because you need like multiple of the same color to fill in a spot, and you are trying to as efficiently as you can put lots of mosaic pieces in next to each other for points. Yes, but also like not getting too far ahead of yourself because if you complete yeah. a horizontal line, that ends the game. Yes, so trying to like hold off on that until you think you're in a winning winning position. Yep. There's also a punishment system in this uh, drafting if you take 
more squares than you can actually place down. Yes, but uh, also there's a whole, like, fuck you, like, if you can work the maths out correctly, you can yes. make other people pick up a bunch of tiles yes. they either can't use or... If you can see that someone in the drafting phase only has space to put down uh, two blues and there's, like, a, bun a pile of five blues still on the table, and you deliberately don't take the five blues yourself so that, that when it comes around to that person they're going to have to take it, excess tiles you pick up that you don't have a place for... Uh, become, like, lost points between mm. rounds. And um, we've talked before about how uh, the second one, Summer Pavilion, yeah. can get, in, especially in two-player, can get way more aggressive yeah. than four-player Summer Pavilion. Indeed. And I think that is almost certainly the case here as well. Oh, it very much feels like it. Um, but yeah, like, we've played, what, three of the Azuls at this point, Um because we've played Stained Glass of Sinestra... I haven't. Oh, uh, I, I played Stained Glass of Sinestra last time I went and saw Mum and Dad, I think. Uh. So, uh, I've played Stained Glass of Sinestra, and we've played a lot of um, Summer, Summer Pavilion. Pavilion, and now we've played the base one. Yes. They all honestly do feel distinct and different enough to feel justified in, like, my parents owning all three, I don't feel like they it's a wasted experience, and I feel like there is something... Unique to be gotten out of each of them. I wouldn't own all three. No. But with my parents being people who are, like, getting into board games more seriously, yeah. I think that it it's one of those things where there is one mechanic that they can remember across all three games and little tweaks they can do between them. There is definitely variation in what they're playing. Yeah, it's 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 not like they've got a collection the size we do for, for board games, yeah. so... Like, I don't think there's anything wrong with going, we want something that's kind of casual, that can be taught fairly quickly. Yes. That's still got quite some quite deep stat yeah. strategy possibilities. It's, we want something simple enough that we can remember what it is, or how to play it well enough that we can teach it to our not particularly board gamey friends, mm. but that has enough strategy that we can sit and play it, just the two of us, and get a little more competitive. Yes. But yeah, it was, it was kind of fun. Again, didn't make me feel the need to go, like, I have to pick up that version of Azul right now. No. But um, had fun having a bit of a, a variation to it. Yeah, and frankly, if we were going to get original Azul, I'd probably get the Mas Master Chocolatier version. Oh, yeah, which is just, it, it's reskinned to be about chocolate making. and It's more brown. <laughs> there's very tasty looking chocolate tokens. Yeah, I mean, the, we should talk about how tactile this game is as well. I mean, all of the Azuls are very tactile. Yeah. What shape are the ones for um, stained glass? So I think they're like sort of diamond, uh, they're, they're much thinner, flatter diamond shapes. Okay. But they're also like see-through. Okay. Um, they're sort of like... Like stained glass, funnily enough. Yes. Um, yes. They're similarly tactile click-clack, but okay. they're uh, like see-through plastic, which has a slightly different feel to it. Okay. Yeah, yes. they make very good tactile game pieces, the Azul yeah. games. The, fir the first game is very much like Jolly Ranchers. The, the second game, they're a little bit thinner, Yeah. but they're diamond-shaped, like Elon quite stretched uh, diamond shapes yeah. so they're uh, good for making like little six petal flowers yeah yeah i i i like both of them individually yeah um yeah i think i think that's uh good fun to have and and to do i i am glad that that uh we that they're having a good enough time with azul to be like oh yeah teach us the the other results we have we yeah. should play more azuls <laughs> We've got these games. Can you teach them to us? Yeah. <laughs> it, yes. That my my parents are not quite at the point where they they feel confident enough to teach themselves new games from scratch, or to uh, just go the on the internet. Yeah. I like. I feel like you know when, uh, Rodney watch it played. I think we've like, pointed think them keep... at Rodney several yeah. times. Yeah. And they still won't do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. But yeah, that was that was fun. We yeah. played some of that at the weekend. Yeah, it was great. Enjoyed that. Yeah. What about you? What else have you played this what week? What else have I played this week? Well, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about a game, but I'm not recommending it. Okay. Okay. Um. So I've been playing a game called Scarlet Tower. Is this the the Solst very vampire survivors you want? Yeah, another survivors yeah. type game. So <laughs> um, this was in a a recent survivors like bundle that mm. was available. Um, and. First of all, it's not finished yet. It's still yeah. in early access. And uh, my second warning with this is the company that makes this mm. released a game last year. Right. That game was in early access. A 
apparently people who bought it and too early because they like the look of the graphics and stuff yeah. have said that it felt like it was rushed to 1.0 as soon as the devs saw the success of Vampire Survivors. Yeah. And as soon as it hit 1.0, they fucked off entirely and haven't been seen. They yes. changed their name on Steam. Well, they they have basically uh, the same game name, but they've added LLC to the end of it. Ah, uh, yes. So it's not even like this person changed their name and and yes. they're connected. Yeah, I see. So a lot of people like feel they have abandoned that project. They yes. also have another game entering early access in May. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people who were burnt on the first game are absolutely rinsing this one. In the yeah. Steam reviews, because they felt like they got completely fucked on the first one. And, and I, th- I feel like that is important context that definitely adds something to my knowledge of the fact that, from the way you described it, this is the most blatant rip-off of Vampire Survivors of the Vampire Survivors likes we've played. I think the more I've played, it has done more to um, distinguish itself. But it definitely starts a bit. Yeah. Mm. When, I, when I first picked it up, I spent a probably my first three runs which is Mm. just under an hour because the runs in this are shorter even though i was doing considerably better at them like my first run was seven seven minutes 42 Mm. which is long for a survivor's game yeah like and i had enough like gold at the end of that that i powered up like a a, like a good chunk of power-ups and a a Mm. good chunk of other stuff and felt like I was already going into the, the second run way more powerful than the first one. Mm. Um, like, I'd already unlocked a new character from that first run. Yeah, that sounds like you've barely had a chance to get the first, like, to, to get a feel for the first I one. I came already... out of the first run with seven achievements and a bunch of unlocks. Yeah. I was like, you're certainly going for the dopamine. The other thing that doesn't distinguish it from Vampire Survivors is it starts in a forest. Yeah, you are in a forest. It gives you, it ramps up the the power creep way more quickly. Yeah, uh, and you do feel way more overpowered, but it is still basically pixel art. Although I would say if um if Vampire Survivors is I don't know eight and a half bit, this is more sixteen bit style, yeah. and it loves its fucking lighting effects. Like yeah. there is. Fog over most of the first level. (laughs) It's got a real Lost Woods vibe, but instead of being transparent things, it is literal, like, volumetric fog with bloom effects on a lot of the explosions and things. Mm. And as someone who wears glasses, and if you are someone who wears glasses, you know what it's like when you get smudges on your lenses and it's like, "Mm, I need to clean these. There is so much fog and bloom in this that I keep going... My eyes keep going, you need to clean your glasses. Ah. Uh, it's, it's not that I need to clean my glasses. It's just really foggy, and that adds an extra layer of blur. Yeah. And while you could say that it, it, they are nicer lighting effects, it doesn't make it any easier to read. It, it, it makes it less readable. And, uh, you know, I, I've played high-level vampire survivors yeah. for a while now. I know how chaotic it can get. After 20 minutes or so. Yeah. But, you know, this is a little bit more zoomed in, I think. Mm. Like, you can see less of the map overall anyway. You don't start with any kind of map. Okay. You don't have any way of telling. There currently isn't, I don't know if there is any plans to, there isn't any kind of um, way of telling what weapon fusions are available. Yeah. The uh, There is the holy water feels like it's ripped straight out of Vampire Survivors. Yeah. The bible that spins around you feels ripped out of Vampire <laughs> Survivors. The only ones that don't feel ripped out of Vampire Survivors are... We thought garlic was a stupid idea, so it's a cloak that, issue, that gives you like a purple aura around you. But it does the same thing. Okay, yeah. Um, there's a lightning rod instead of uh, the lightning ring. But it does... But it does basically yeah. the same thing. Um, there there are things that are very much its own. But yeah. it takes a while to unlock them. Yeah. And most of that is... Did you find this thing in the game? Cool. Level it up all the way to max. Cool. You've opened something for the next game. Like, I finished my second run at nearly twice... Or over twice my first one. And at that point, I had, like, another seven or eight achievements, a bunch of Mm. unlocks. And I think at that point, I had unlocked 
all of the other characters that are available. Hmm. Um... I wish, or might have even been the run after that, but like within three runs I had unlocked every single character, and by the time of my fourth run I had done all of the basic power-up stuff, like um, max eight, um, like adding HP and yeah. uh, health regeneration, speed, mm. crit, uh, crit chance, crit damage, things like that. Like I had all of that stuff ramped all the way up. And yeah. maybe it's the fact that I've played enough Vampire Survivors I know which things... Should be best leveled up first. Yeah, but yeah, the the fact that like there's like a random event that happens where a bunch of uh, carnivorous-looking plants surround you. It's like, mm, yep, that that's straight out of Vampire Survivors. Yeah, but then you do start to get like more interesting stuff. And al- although it's irritating that you can't look up the fusions you've done previously in the game, yeah. and that I had to play it for nearly five hours to get a map. Mm. Um, the secret is just keep spending money at the vendor, but you know the vendor is expensive initially and hard to find because it's just luck based and you don't have a map to tell where they are on the map. But as soon as you've got the map, you can open the start of a level and go, oh, I can see two vendors already, and work out where to go towards that. There's um familiars that will give you like random bonuses, and as they level up, they will open like more random bonuses that can also be powered up using one of the game's three in-game currencies. Mm. Luckily, it's all in-game for that stuff, though. (laughs) Appreciate that. I won't say I haven't had fun with it, because once I got through that initial phase of... First of all, I can't tell what anything does. Like, there isn't enough in-game documentation, although it does describe itself as being in alpha, Mm. which is weird for 0.9.1. And yeah. also a game that is already being sold, but it, it feels fairly typical of uh, a lot of developers now who don't seem to know what alpha is. Mm. It certainly isn't what they're generally plugging it for. Like, but anyway, there there is stuff to be added. There's bosses. The most annoying thing at the moment, apart from the the fact that you can't check your um, weapon fusions, is that. In order to get to new levels, or unlock new levels, you have to play the same level over and over and unlock extra difficulties on that level. Okay. And it does give you some slightly interesting stuff. There's a snow event that can happen, like, randomly, seemingly. You'll Mm. just be there, and all of a sudden it'll go all snowy, and you'll have, like, snowman turning up, and, uh, like, little elf, elf, like, Keebler-type elves, Mm. um running around. The higher your level is, the more different enemies you'll first start to find. You'll start to find random bosses that will appear at various points. Because it, 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 it's it got this weird day-night cycle thing, after 12 minutes it will um, ping you to night time, in which time at which point the enemies are more aggressive, they're faster, and there's werewolves everywhere. Hmm. And you'll usually get a boss at that point and another boss right at the very end of, of 24 minutes at the end of a full run. Well, uh, probably around 20 minutes, to be fair. Because mm. once you've worked out a few fusions and you've managed to work out ways of getting them consistently, you can pretty much rock that boss in about 21 minutes. Probably quicker, who knows. But it's fine. It's about four quid at full price. I think it's on discount at the moment. But given their history, yeah, I cannot, in all good conscience, recommend it to people no, right now. Nothing about this gives me confidence. No. Because it sounds like, ooh, Vampire Survivors is popular. Rush the final, the last project and just get it out the door. Uh, d- uh, w- do we have any original ideas for a Vampire Survivors? No? Okay, I guess just start building it off of actual Vampire Survivors. Just like do what they did. And, like, we'll work out how to make it original later. Yeah. These are all signs that are not reassuring for an early access project. Oh, um, one other thing I forgot to mention. The assets are used in all of their games. Like, their previous, like, the previous abandoned game that they've changed their name since has, like, the same boss that occurs at the end of, um, or, uh, just towards the end of Daylight. And the boss for the second level I've also spotted in that, in that game. All of the characters, 
They seem to, like, rotate which one is the, like, primary character that they use in trailers. Okay. But, like, there's regularly, like, scenes of all of these characters sitting around on boxes. It's like, yeah, that's in the current game and also in the next game on the trailers. Mm. So they are reusing their own assets a lot. But at least they are their own assets as far as I can tell. That's something. But, um, yeah, it is, it is deeply con- concerning. Um, ho- I hope that this comes out good, cause it, yeah. it could, it could do. There's a lot of potential there. It could do. Um, there, there there's enough stuff once you work out what it all is, um, that you, um, the, it has a potential to, to make its own space within the survivors genre. Right now, the main problems are the, uh, they've got a wiki, they've got a fan wiki, mm-hmm. it is not up to date, and <laughs> it's missing tons of assets, and some of the information just isn't there yet. Yeah. My ul- my ultimate conclusion a lot has recently has been, rather than going, what does this do? I don't know what this do. It does The game isn't telling me what this does. It's like, what would this do in Vampire Survivors? <sighs> yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Actually, it, it does do that. Greed yeah. just increases how much money I can get. Yes. <laughs> What 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 would here? Yeah, what what would the game that I know better than this one do in this situation? WWVSD. Yeah. <laughs> what about you? What have you played? Uh, I played a couple of other things. I, I can rattle through nice and quickly. Ooh. Um, I have been filling the time waiting for Tears of the Kingdom to come out by uh replaying Hyrule Warriors: Age of Calamity. Yes. Which is the Hyrule Warriors game that. Uh, it's been out a few years. I feel like I can talk about this reasonably openly. Uh, it presents itself as a uh, a prequel to Breath of the Wild. Hey, you know in all the flashbacks in Breath of the Wild a hundred years ago, there was like a whole war that happened? What if you were playing a Dynasty Warriors game with like hundreds of enemies on screen in that story? So you're like, you know, going through... Um, like f- meet it, meeting the various ch- uh, champions and going and like fighting off Ganon's monsters. Proving like, yourself the... to Ravali. Yeah, like do- doing all the stuff that leads up to the events of Breath of the Wild. You and... know, all that plot that was sort of gated off from you in, in Breath of yeah. the Wild? What, what if you... Why not try so, that? like, the first, I'm going to say like 20 hours-ish of this is basically that. It's, do you just... Because this is why I went back to it, is I was like, I'm just craving more story content where I get to watch cutscenes of the characters from Breath of the Wild interacting mm. and having actual conversations and character growth. And I will say, I think Age of Calamity, up until its turning point, I'll get to that in a minute, does a better job than Breath of the Wild of telling the story of the champions a hundred years ago. Mm. It does a better job of, generally speaking, showing the interactions between like this group of five or six characters, the champions, Link, Zelda, and Impa, mm. and what their dynamic was. There's a lot of stuff in here that feels like it is just really nice additive content to the story we experienced. Yeah. I'm not going to say what comes next is bad, <laughs> but like you've got to be ready for it. So it's got some real Koei Tecmo fan fiction. Y- yeah. So this is not strictly a prequel to Breath of the Wild. Um, let me try and explain as succinctly as I can what this is. In Breath of the Wild's flashbacks, you learn about, like, the, the, the war a hundred years ago. Yeah. Um, where Hyrule falls, Link basically dies and has to be resurrected. They lose the war and have to try again in Breath of the Wild. Cool? Mm-hmm. What if, during the events of that, when Zelda unlocked her powers, trying to, trying to protect Link, it woke up a little guardian robot that she had in a box back in Hyrule Castle, and this robot time-traveled back in time to the start of the war before like the before um all of the guardians have turned with photos in its memory of like the the war going on and traveled back to meet zelda and go hey here's a bunch of photos that show you that like war is coming and it will come in the form of the guardians turning and it's coming on this date therefore sort of changing events because the people kn- know what is coming and when but also what if some of Calamity Ganon went back in time through the portal? So now there's two Calamity Ganons in this timeline. The one that's trying to break free under the Hyrule Castle, but also another one that's off doing its own thing, meeting a villain who just wasn't relevant in Breath of the Wild. 
But also, and this is where I've just gotten to, is what if right at the, the bit where like, ah, Calamity Ganon is rising and all the Guardians have turned and we're about to lose the war. What if we just like grabbed some characters from the future and brought them back to the past so that they could help us in the fight so that like we didn't lose that battle? And then it just kind of becomes what if fan fiction. Yeah. And like, it's not bad. It is fun what if fan fiction. But it is definitely what if we took characters from the future and prevented any of the bad th like what if we made it so there were no negative consequences in the past in breath of the wild and everything was fine i mean a lot of people still die i mean a lot of people still die but like in different no ways one we care about because, well here's the thing is it's like no one no one dies yay oh no a, a, a second calamity ganon did come back through time and now there are two calamity ganons so like the problem is, like, lessened, and then it gets way worse, because now there's two Ganons in this timeline yep. at the same time, and one of them's working with a time wizard, and everything gets a bit chaotic. And then you get to the post-game, where there's just so much to do. That yeah. lo Much like Hyrule Warriors Definitive Edition, you do feel like there's almost too much of it. Like yeah. an almost an overwhelming amount of content. Yeah, this is, this is a Warriors game, and there is overwhelming amounts of things to be doing if you want to be doing them. Um, which, like, was a bit overwhelming when it first came out, but now while I'm, like, just desperately trying to fill, like, two and a half weeks for Tears of the Kingdom to come yeah. out, I'm like, oh no, this is perfect. Just, like, keep throwing content at me. This is Zelda themed. Content. Um, but yeah, I, I'll say what I've said before about, uh, Koei Tecmo's stuff with the, like, Dynasty Warriors type games. They do such a better job when they're working with other people's properties than they do when they're making their own games. Hmm. Um, Age of Calamity is, like, a very lovingly made, um, in as much as, like, up until the point where it becomes what if fan fiction, it feels incredibly faithful. Like, they've got all the voice actors back from Breath of the Wild. Um, clearly a lot of, like, the maps and assets are just the locations from Breath of the Wild. Um, Seems the, like. the game looks, like, basically identical to Breath of the Wild. Like, yeah. they did a really good job of, like, replicating the look of things, the yes. feel of things. Uh, when you're fighting against, like, let's say you're fighting against a Lionel, your knowledge of the Lionel's move set in Breath of the Wild can be used mm -hmm. to know, like, oh, I recognize that animation, I need to side dodge to get a flurry rush in. Yeah. Even if the, um, the, the way the, uh, Sheik Slate runes work yeah. is slightly different. It is, but, but like, they are thematically appropriate to yeah. what you need to be doing with them. Yeah, every character. different enemies. Every character has essentially a bomb, a magnesis, a, uh, Cryonis, and yeah, yeah, all the things. And they work basically how you'd expect, but different flavors that kind of fit them. Yeah. Um, I love that you have playable combat Zelda in this. Oh, yeah. Zelda is great as a playable combat character. Let us play as her in Tears of the Kingdom. I like that you play as the great fairies who are way too fucking large to yep. use in any interior level. It's great. They're I haven't tried them in the interior levels, but oh, they are just ridiculous. Oh, the Yiga hideout levels are the best ones <laughs> to try them in. They barely fucking fit in the corridors. It's hilarious. They barely th fit through the gates in like, yes. the outdoor areas. Uh, I, I had a Lionel show up in a corridor in the Yiga hideout <laughs> while I was the Great Fairies. Could not tell what I was doing. It was a wonderful <laughs> time. Uh, Hestu, playable Hestu is great. Uh, never forget playable Hestu. Yeah. Nakey nakey. I'm really enjoying revisiting this as a like little supplemental while I'm like trying to be in the Zelda mood ready for Tears of the Kingdom. Uh, Age of Calamity and, and indeed Hyrule Warriors Definitive Edition is one I j or a couple that I just dip back into periodically yeah. for a bit of a, a, a fun power fantasy and then explore. Yeah. Because there is so much content that it's... It, once I've finished the, the story stuff, it's not enough that I want to keep going... Until I've hundred percented it, because yeah. it would take forever. Yeah, but it's nice to just dip back in and go. I am making progress. Yeah, and just maybe by the time it. I'm old enough to retire, but won't be able to afford to retire, <laughs> then I will have finished that game. Yeah, ah, uh, yeah. It's 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 a fun little bit of space filling nonsense. Hell yeah. Um, have you played anything else this week? Uh. Well, uh, I'll very quickly talk about a couple of other things I've started playing today, oh, and yes. I've not put a huge amount of time into them so far, Ooh. but uh, I started playing three Game Boy games uh, this week. 
Uh, I have to say, these look very cool. Yeah, so these are like new, newly developed Game Boy games uh, by a company called Incube 8. Also love that. Uh, with a sort of Incube and then number 8 at the end. Yeah. Uh, so these are like, one of them is a game, like a regular Game Boy game, the other two are Game Boy Color ones, mm-hmm. and they are, uh, I, I received them in like, a nice box that had like the little plastic Game Boy game case. The proper square Game Boy game classic box. Yeah, a single Game Boy cartridge in one little plastic thing you close yep. it in. With a manual. Yeah, with a manual. With and notes some, in the back. And some nice vinyl stickers. Oh, yes. Uh, the, like the package, like they do a really good job of making it feel like I'm opening a new like Game Boy game I might have bought off the shelf in the late 90s. If you are still a Game Boy player and you have a Game Boy collection of actual it's... boxed Game Boy games, these will not look yeah. that out of place these, on your shelf. And, like, these are not cheap to get that way. Like, they are, they are. Uh, from what I can tell, like, 60 Canadian dollars each. I don't like, know. Like, in box, which I would need to I do. I don't know what uh, the Canadian let, exchange rate let is. Me, let me do the uh, the maths quick. Okay, so it's about £35. Pounds. Oh, wow, that's way okay. cheaper than I thought. Yeah, I, I, th- I, th- I thought the, the conversion rate was worse. Okay. I thought it was closer to US yeah. dollars. So. Uh, about thirty-five pound, like British pounds, uh, sixty Canadian dollars each, is like boxed copy, manual stickers, the little case, and everything. They also do two tiers below that that are like you can get just the cartridge, okay. or you can just buy a ROM if you happen to have a device that plays uh, Game Boy ROMs. Nice. Yeah. So I'll talk about the three that I've like started playing today. Yeah. Um, uh, and I'll talk about them in, like, order of what I have the most to say about. So, okay. uh, I started playing one called The Machine, mm-hmm. um, which is a game about you are this little abstract creature living inside what appears to be just like a big, uh, big, c- a city that is in a big machine on wheels going through some wasteland or something, mm-hmm. and your life lives in there. And it's the day that you're supposed to take the big test where everyone's, you know, your future career prospects are determined and you didn't practice for the test or study for it. Oh no. And you get a pretty subpar score and your options, uh, and it seems like this is a genuine choice. Your options are cop or factory worker. Factory worker. I chose factory worker. I was like, I'm not going to be a fucking cop. Thank you for making that a genuine choice so I could avoid being a cop. Um, and it seems like it is trying to, like, gameplay, uh, be about, like, the, the doldrum of feeling stuck in, like, a depressing routine within the system, as it were. The system, so, like, yeah. the, the loop so far as I've been playing it is, like, get the train, get the train home to the crappy apartment you share with someone who I believe is just called The Foot, uh, who, Last time I got home, he'd eaten all my food in the fridge, but he'd left his rotting food in the fridge and complained there was a there was a bad smell in the kitchen, despite it being his rotting food. Like that kind of level of thing. Wow. To then get back on the train and go back into town to go to work. <laughs> right. Um, to go work at a manual job that you're sort of in. Yeah, you're sorting packages onto conveyor belts to go to the right places, and a conveyor belt, uh, a package will show up with a number on it, and you switch some conveyor belts to go different directions, so the package goes where it's meant to go. Mm-hmm. To then get the train back home, uh, and you get your like two two bucks at the end of the day that you can go to the bar next to work and be like, I'm gonna buy myself a drink, and I'm gonna gamble this dollar on the horse race, and now I have no money from the end of the day. Back to get on the train and go home and do this over again. And I feel like this is probably building to some kind of, like, you know, some kind of commentary or some kind of, like, breaking out of the routine or whatnot. Mm. But so far it is doing a very effective job of, like, narratively conveying, working within, like, being stuck in a bad condition, a uh, bad situation. Uh, lovely pixel art. Plays really nicely. And I assume the, the dialogue is changing... Uh, yeah, it seems. This? Yeah, yeah, it seems to be. You've got. Still, like, like, you were supposed to choose cop. This is just the fake, fake out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Other than that, the uh, the other two that I've started playing, uh, there's one called Twenty Twenty One Moon Escape. <gasps> uh, you are um, a, a, an astronaut that's managed to get some some critical war plans, and you're trying to get them back to back to your sort of planet's government. But something goes wrong, and you crash land on on a strange moon, Gosh, and you got to fix your ship because you you need to get the Basically, you need to get the Death Star plans back to back to Alderaan mm-hmm. or, or wherever you're taking them. It is a top-down adventure game, somewhat in the vein of uh, like a Legend of Zelda type thing. Mm-hmm. But your weapon 
is a gun that only has three charges in it. And you can, like, re reload it, but you have very limited ammunition to work with, and often will just have to, at least at the start, avoid the things that will damage you, and, like, really save your shots for when there is a thing you can't just avoid. Right. Uh, which is an interesting uh, gameplay wrinkle. Mm. You, th there is an interesting narrative unfolding between you and the AI from your ship that, mm -hmm. uh, like, is, is nicely written. The map is pretty good and clear to follow. Uh, it's one of those sort of, like, every time you go off the edge of the screen, you load a new square of, of screen in. But Okay, flick screen. Yeah. But it's good at, like, conveying where you need to go and like when you check the map it not only shows you like this is where you are on the map now it shows you where you last were and traces your route to where you are now so you can go okay that's how i got here mm. uh which is helpful uh some interesting mechanics i've come across that are things like um there was sort of almost like a little puzzle dungeon that involved like using these bounce pads to jump over uh, specific bits of environment and trying to work out how to get where I needed to to like navigate that space. Mm. It definitely seems like it's got some maybe slightly smaller scale and as I've seen yet not like boss fight elements but it's trying to sort of play around a little bit with that sort of puzzle dungeon-esque stuff going okay. on. I'm intrigued by it. Uh, of the three this is the only one that is a like black and white Game Boy game. This isn't uh, like isn't in colour. Mm -hmm. um, but still, very nice art to it. Uh, the one that I kind of want to talk about most is uh, Dango Dash, which is a game that I keep thinking I have a handle on what it is, and then it <laughs> like is not at no. all what I think it is. So, uh, you are like in... The, the vibe I get is you're in your 20s, you haven't moved out of home, and mum's like, hey, you've got to get a job. Can't just lie around all day doing nothing. Millennials can't do that anymore. Right, we're, we're ruining their uh, their their <laughs> retirement plans. Um, so you you get told to go work at your your uncle's dumpling shop, uh, delivering dumplings, and it seems like it's going to be just a conceit for a side-scrolling platformer where you're trying to get the dumplings to the customers as fresh as possible, and you're like three pips of health uh, represent how how fresh the dumplings are. So if you take damage. That's uh, lower quality dumplings by the time you get to, them, to the customer. Right. And if that had been what the game was, I'd have been like, yeah, this is a cute, colourful, old side-scrolling platformer. And then you go on a delivery where you try and deliver some dumplings to someone, and they're like, oh yeah, he's in the tent over there somewhere. He's not in the tent. It's like, oh, maybe he's in this cave right next to the tent. Now you're in a proper Zelda dungeon. Go do a Zelda dungeon for a while. Find out a ma about a magic scroll of prophecy. And is it still important to keep the dumplings fresh at this point? Um, kind of. <laughs> um, yeah, you find out about the fact that, from what I can tell, maybe we're living on Skyloft-style floating islands, and uh, someone's trying to like, d maybe they're trying to get this island to crash to the ground so that they can bring their island back up, and. So I was like, okay, cool. It's it's a side-scrolling platformer that's sometimes going to be a little bit of a Zelda dungeon-y Zelda game. Okay. And then I got home, and I, I, I got fired from my job. Uh, so oh, I go yeah. home. I go home, and Mum's like, okay, clear, clear out clear out the basement, like, sort stuff out. Then it's a side-scrolling, almost like a Metroidvania, and I unlocked, like, power-ups and got new abilities. For fresher dumplings? Uh, I, I mean, I got a double jump that certainly would make it help easier to deliver dumplings, I guess. And then it became sort of an open exploration game where, like, like, I don't have a clear objective right now. It's, hey, go around the t village and t the town and find out what people need doing for them. And that those will be quests. Go do some quests around town. Is it turning into Shenmue? I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm really enjoying it. But I've, here's the thing. I'm, t I'm hesitant to say... Like, to say, okay, I've got a grasp on what this game is now, it keeps throwing new things at me. And the thing is, none of them feel out of place. It just keeps genre shifting. It keeps throwing new genres at me. And I'm intrigued. It's Which is weird, because this is the game that looked the most unassuming of the three. Right? And that's the thing. <laughs> it's, it's opening, like, couple of levels are really unassuming, and then it starts being like, hey... Hey, what if what if we were considerably more genres than we were five minutes ago? <laughs> Amazing. So I'm super curious about this, like whatever whatever this game is. This is the one that has most caught my interest so far. It's the one that I'm like most excited to put more time into. Wow. Um, but yeah, 
Uh, I'm sure I will talk about all three of those again in a bit more depth next week. But I'm excited to hear it. Yeah, I've started playing some some new Game Boy games. Uh, they play, they work on original hardware as well as I was playing them on the um, oh, what's it called, the Analog Pocket, which is mm-hmm. nice fancy Game Boy that has a little backlit screen. If you're playing something that has save state functionality, um, the cartridge does not seem to like you trying to do a save state on your save state hardware with the cartridge in. Yeah. That's fair. Which is like, yeah. Does it have battery backup on its own? Do any of them have, like, saves? Uh, yeah, no, they have saves. Okay. Um, and Incubate seem to be really good about having their games do autosave. Like, nice. more frequently than I would expect. Like, 2021 Moon Escape is the only one I think didn't have autosave, but it had, like, just go to this save thing and click and you've it's saved. Okay. These all have, like, built-in functionality to save your progress, and at least the machine and Dango Dash both are, like, very on it about autosaves. Yeah, uh, I wonder if it's something to do with the fact that the cartridge is trying to, within its own ROM, save states I, using the battery. Yeah. I don't know enough about the technical aspects, but yeah, just as a heads up, like, if you're using a device that saves states, the save state functionality, like, doesn't play nice with the cartridge, but oh. yeah. Probably fine with the ROMs, though. <laughs> I mean, probably, yeah. Uh, but that's those. Uh, is that everything we've played this week? I think so. <gasps> well then, time for this. Meow. Oh, hey. Meow. Mothers. What's up? I'm very disappointed. What's up, Kika? What's wrong? I have noticed that over the last six weekends, you have not been here for five of them. I mean, I, I don't think it's that many. I think you're exaggerating mm. a little. I have been alone, unsupervised. I mean, just for like no one to cuddle. Just like for some little periods of time, like Nina, no, no more than a day. No one to be a warm spot on. I know, but we come and bring bring you many pets when we come back. But I have had to spend a whole weekend alone. I uh, I have not had a board game to swipe off a table. No, not not one. I have not had a snacky to eat that has been dropped. Well, I mean, how about next time we leave a board game on the table so you can start batting around the pieces? Mm, it's not the same if you're not there to get slightly het up about it. <laughs> or okay. at least be charmed by the fact that I rolled a nat 20. <laughs> I mean, we can leave you a dice and, like, if, if you roll a nat 20, leave it like that and we can be marveled by it when we get back. Mm, might have to go under the couch with all the other things that are movable. <laughs> mm. Well, well, look, we we give you many, many love all day, every day. When you know, like most. No, days. sometimes, 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 one of you leaves the house and goes to a office. I understand. Yeah, the other. I one... suspect there are other cats there, and I do not like that. <laughs> well, the other one of us looks after you when that happens. Mm, this is not the routine. I know. I know. I like routine. Yeah, we know you like and routine. And dreamies. I don't get nearly enough dreamies. I know. This is an intervention. <laughs> I am in- intervening. Well, well, I see you there trying to intervene. Mm. And I raise you some head scratches. Mm. And dreamies. Okay, here you go. <laughs> Ow. Tasty thingy. Num, num, num. Thank, thank you so much for having me along uh, again today. Thank yeah, you. I mean you're 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 one of us, so uh, it's good to uh, good to have you along. You know, superheroing. It's uh, it's not for everyone, but uh... well, well, uh, often you know, uh, us street level heroes don't don't always get invited along to the big stuff, so it, it's 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 appreciated. No, no, you don't. So, uh, so why did you get into uh, superheroing? What was it for you? Oh, you, you know, uh, watching the the injustice going on around me and feeling like I had to do something to 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 help, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same. I mean, I just can't stand looking at you know poor people all day. So you know, just like get the suit on, get down there, and you know, smack a few of them about, you know. Um, How else are you going to deal with the drug dealers if you're not just you know do, you know punting a few of them about? <laughs> oh, um, uh huh. Uh huh. Uh-huh. So uh, what's this you're wearing? Is this uh, pajamas you've got got on? You really need to uh, you really need to get you know one of these high tech suits. I mean, mine didn't cost me less than uh, half a million. 
Well, I mean, I, I, I'm I, working on, like, a budget of a street-level hero. I, I made this myself in uh, my room. Uh, I, I I was uh, in between shifts at the at, at the soup kitchen, so we've, we've I really didn't have a lot of We've time. got a job! We've got a job! Oh, that's so quaint! It's, oh, it's so well, quaint! I'm, I mean, so... I've got, like, three jobs, and I also volunteer. <laughs> oh, oh, that's so quaint! It's so quaint. I, I think I had a job once, but now, I mean, I, I suppose I do sit on a lot of uh, boards, although, obviously, you don't know who I am. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah... You know, uh, oh, look at the time. I completely forgot I have I have one of my three jobs I have to get to. That's... Oh, that's so lovely. Oh, have, have fun at all your jobs and we'll be, uh, we'll just uh... be up here saving the world. Uh, I think it's Azarak's turn, you know, to kind of have a go at uh, the world domination and we're all going to, you know, do our usual. Oh, we're going to get you, we're going to take you down. And then, you know, I think it's my turn next week to uh, to give that a go. But, you know... World's got to be in peril. We billionaires can't, uh, you know, can't, uh, you know, just sit around all day. We're gonna have something to do, you know, make it look like we're actually worth something, you know. Anyway, okay, so, uh, you okay. have to have fun with your uh, whatever it is, good, good, and um, goodbye, goodbye. We'll probably goodbye, pop down your way to goodbye. beat up some uh, some drug goodbye, dealers later. Goodbye. Note to self: um, if these are the heroes, I might have to have my villain turn. So. Huh. What have you put in your eyes? Uh, well, we watched a thing yesterday. We did. Uh, we've watched Mighty Morphin Power Rangers once and always. Yeah. Yeah. Which is the uh, uh, 25th, 35th, uh, 25th anniversary, I think, um, special for Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. What year are we in? I think... 23. 23. I remember it being on TV oh. in 96, so... Yeah. It's, it's the anniversary special for Mighty Morphin Power Rangers... Uh, that brings several of the original Power Ranger actors back to do a sort of hour-long adventure. And I have complicated feelings about this one, and I'm going to try and summarize them as best I can. I think for the most part, it captured the slightly silly, goofy tone of the original. Um, for the most part, I yeah. I appreciated like that the putties hadn't been turned into like... <laughs> Big uh, latex suited yeah. or, or any fancy. They, they like They still... looked like they could have been just lifted straight out of the series. Yeah, they still sort of just run at civilians and wobble their arms and make sort of gobbly turkey sounds at them yeah. rather than actually attacking them. Uh, a lot of the a lot of the visual effects were like the right kind of cheesy that I was like, yep, this is what I'm after. Yeah, what, what's it, um, <sighs> is it Snizzard? Yes. Snizzard, Snizzard has this whole thing with snakes coming coming out of their hands that <laughs> reminded me very much of the original Mortal Kombat movie. Yep. But I was like, no, I don't mm. care that that's cheesy. That is exactly what I want from a Mighty yeah. Morphin movie. Uh, you know, there, there is some contrivance to the plot, but in the way that like you kind of forgive with Mighty Morphin, because like, it is what it is. <laughs> we know why we're here. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm not going to pretend that the plot setup they have doesn't feel a bit weird in that it is very clearly a sort of love letter to um the actress who played trini the original yellow ranger mm -hmm. it is a story about the fact that like she she died um very suddenly like that actress uh she was like only in her late 20s and it is an in-universe story about trini's death and like that is, I, like, in a vacuum, I think they handled that well. It was a surprising amount of, like, emotional core to a story. Like, I did not expect to be emotionally invested the way that I was there. Mm. I think it was a sweet way to go. It's just unfortunate, and there's nothing that could have really been done about this, that David Jason Frank, who played Tommy, did not return for this, and then passed away, and... The fact that there is a Green Ranger in this, but they don't address that it's not Tommy, and that there's just sort of a shoehorned end also in memory of Tommy, uh, Tommy's actor at the end as well. Yeah, because I, I get the impression that this was well underway by the time that that happened. Yes. Um, from what I understand, yeah, he was alive when this went on, and he was not involved. Yeah, and, and that's fine if you yeah. don't want to be involved. But, I, I think they did yeah. it. I think. Without the context of um, him dying uh, since this started, yeah. I think they did a, as good a job as, as as they could have done of 
Okay, the actors who aren't coming back, we have a way of getting you out yes. of the way. They they did admirably, but it just the con in the context of his having passed, yes. it feels like a v- it 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 feels weird that mm. he that the story is not also addressing his death. Yes. And I know why that is, but it doesn't stop it feeling a bit of a a hanging thread. Mm. But that said, it did it, it was largely a enjoyable, sweet. Uh, kind of goofy revisit. Um, uh, 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 the one moment that, like, I was a bit disappointed with the visual and stuff. I think we both were. Yeah. Is so, and I think it hurt worse because it came on the tails of something really good. Is yes. all of the Megazords, like individual Megazords, coming in ready to transform looked great. Yeah, it was, that a, was a really good shot. Like, it looked yeah. like they'd taken the original model props and maybe given them a bit of a wash to add yeah. a little bit of grime. But I, I think even that was yeah. uh, uh, CG, it, but it still, that looked really good. That looked fantastic. It was a really nice, faithful, like, upgrade of the original shot. Mm-hmm. And then once they transform, it... it I it really too would... too shiny CG. Yeah, then. it's too shiny CG, and it's the one point where the visual effects in this really, like, I, I felt let down. Yeah. I'd have rather just seen the person in the Snizzard costume... On like a fake moon set with yeah. someone in a Megazord outfit. That's like, what I wanted. Yeah, I like make because like you wouldn't have had to make a new Snizzard. You just like make the set at, like scaled as such that he looks big, and ma- just make a physical Megazord outfit. Right. Like, it's it's gonna look goofy, but that's what we're, we're here. That's for. why we're here. We're here to see someone in a cardboard suit fight a Snizzard. Hell yeah! More than we're here <laughs> to see like like I know you want to do the cool like backflip nonsense you want to do but like if you must throw those in as extra effects but for the body of the fight it has to be two people in a suit having it in a ridiculous manner it's exactly the flavor of disappointment i have with the first power rangers movie ending with the cgi megazord fight yeah it's it's the one place where it's like that that really feels like not what you didn't give the fans the thing that they're here for um Otherwise enjoyable, I think they, I think they did the best they could with what they had, and I, I had an enjoyable, if a little conflicted time with it. Yeah, I, it was, for the most part, it was all the cheesy goodness that I have come to love from Power Rangers <laughs> vicariously through you. It, it was nice to see a couple of Rangers who never really got the spotlight back in my Morph and get to have the spotlight here. Yeah, because Red was not in charge of this team. Oh yeah, no, Red was Red was along for the ride. Red was not the leader here, and mm-hmm. it was that was nice. Yeah. Um, what about you? What did you watch this week? Uh well, because we we did some commuting. We did. Uh, I I got to read some book. Yeah. Uh, tell us about book you read. So I read uh, through uh, the latest Adventure Zone comic book, The Eleventh Hour, which is the what fifth book in this series. I believe so. so we yeah. had, um, gosh, what was the first uh, one? The first one was um, the 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 fire thing. Uh, yes, it's the, the flame gauntlet, gauntlet and the, them finding out about the Bureau of Balance. Yes. Uh, then it's the the the, the race drag racing. Yeah, the, dra- and the yeah. Um, nature belt. Yep. Uh, then it's the the tr- the murder mystery train. Um, murder we might on have the had Rockport the order limited. Of those around. Yeah, murder on the Rockport Limited. Yeah, actually, I think you're right. I think that is before um, the yeah. race. Then there was Crystal Kingdom, which is the pink crystals oh, on the space station. Yes. So yeah, this is what the fifth one. Yeah. Um, I I think this was one of my favourite stories at the time. Um, I I really love what they've done with this, and I I love the characterization that the artist has done for. Some of the scenes, there is one particular scene involving a traumatised Magnus that I think they absolutely captured Mm. that I have just relived the worst moment of my life. I'm gonna need a minute. Um, And I I think that just sort of completely gobsmacked, shell-shocked moment, and I think that that is perfectly captured in, in, in... the uh in the imagery there the way they've done uh realized the different characters for all the people um living in uh in the town i think was beautiful i 
like we got to see the um the chance plants for the first time yeah. obviously yeah yeah it was it was good i i very much like this one and i think that it's 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 that bubble time loop um narrative like how are you going to keep living the same thing try and try and solve the yeah. mystery and i think they captured that and some of the whole those little out of character things where they're talking to the dm and this little bubble of griffin floats into <laughs> <laughs> to yeah. just be sort of there like, hey, yeah, I'm the DM. <laughs> um, and they play around with some of the like comic booky type stuff of um, Griffin wanting to call it the minute hand. It's a minute hand because it's the minute hand from the clock. Yeah. And and um, Magnus is like, no, it's it's the chance line. So he's like, but I've already written the the thing with the description <laughs> of what it is and what it do. <laughs> okay, I'll change it. And that was kind of fun. The way they managed to get straight into the story and then sort of dip back a little bit at various times and do uh, some of some of that sort of downtime stuff as little flashbacks between chapters worked really well because you you had like you managed to rush straight into the narrative, yeah, and not hang around too much with that, but not lose any of the interaction with other characters, which. While it might not seem super important right now, it is absolutely going to be necessary yes. for the final arc. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think they did a great job. There's a whole section at the end where um, Carrie Peach, the artist, breaks down some of the um, uh, sketches, various sketches for working out different characters, uh, building the town, uh, doing like a low poly model of it in Blender mm -hmm. to sort of try and work out how, how they were going to block out shots and things like that. And yeah, still feels like a, a, a good, good thing that they have managed to do while also trying to be careful to avoid owing Wizards of the Coast any money <laughs> mm. um, from this uh, and, and also capturing and tidying up a little bit on, on the part of, of the, um, the original uh, podcast because that's the thing when you're going from week to week you can't always get it quite right and there are some things that might be a little bit rough around the corners but you can sort of improve that if you're doing a retelling of that mm. what about you have you watched anything else uh, i watched a couple of things on on youtube just mm. a couple of video essays and whatnot uh i'll quickly rattle through some i watched a video called the emotional wisdom of skyward sword by mm. liam triforce um it is a really interesting video from someone who absolutely hated Skyward Sword on first play. Okay. Um, and part of that is like situational, um, due to some illness that, and like that game's design choices not being accessible oh, to them. I think I've heard about this person. Yeah. Um, but also partially about like coming into this game wanting it to be something it wasn't. And coming back to it years later and feeling very differently about it and being like, I now really enjoy it. I don't think it's flawless. I think it is deeply flawed. Mm. But I also really respect a lot of the things it does, and I really love it for what it is. And sort of charting this journey he had with his original playthrough into replaying it, it's a just a really interesting look at all the things positive and negative that Skyward Sword is. Mm. Um, I also uh, was watching a video called What the Good Place Finale Revealed About Jason Mendoza uh, by I Think I Can Write on YouTube. Which is a really interesting look at, like, in, it, uh, a lot of the time when people talk about character arcs on The Good Place, people don't really talk about, about Jason's character arc on that show. Yeah. And his is an interesting arc because, like, not to, like, spoil too much of the video, the first time we met, meet Jason in season one of The Good Place, we are introduced to him as Jason the quiet, unspeaking monk in The Vow of Silence. And we quickly realise that's not the kind of person Jason is. But by the end of that show, he kind of displays a lot of qualities that you might associate with a monk. And he kind of comes full circle to, you know, being okay with quiet and his own thoughts and inner peace in ways that are a really interesting parallel to where he starts. Mm. And it's really interesting to look at a lot of his later characterization in the lens of him becoming the monk 
essentially having the monk-like qualities he initially has to pretend to have. Mm. Um, you know, I don't think I am too far off wanting to do another re- uh, watch through of I'm, the good place. I look when you're ready, I'll go on that journey with you. Because I know, it, like obviously, straight after it was like, yeah. "Yep, I'm glad we watched that," and we have so much else to watch and get through. Yeah. But like, it's been what. What, three or four years now? Yeah, probably. Maybe? And, like, yeah, I, I think I could yeah. definitely manage it another there's, watch. There's that. a lot of things watching this document, uh, this this sort of, like, video essay where I was like, I could rewatch The Good Place. I think it helps that at this point it is all out and all available rather yeah. than any time between seasons. Indeed. Because I think we, we came in at, what, the end of the first season? So we did yes. have a little gap before second. I think the, se- the first season had just about finished airing, and we managed to go in... I think we both went in unspoiled on what the I thing was. I had no was. idea. Yeah. I, we, we both managed to, to finish season one unspoiled just before season two came out, which was, mm. like, the perfect way to enjoy that show. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm up for a rewatch at some point. Yay! Uh, other than Maybe that... Maybe we can put that on in the background when we play Tears of the Kingdom. <laughs> I'm very up for that. <laughs> um, the only other thing I watched this week was I, I just because Tears of the Kingdom's nearly out, and I'm like I'm deep in that rabbit hole. I rewatched some old um, gameplay previews of Breath of the Wild. Uh, um, yes, this is your the new thing is coming. Up. What was the old thing? What did we think? Yeah, back then. So like, there are two batches of previews that exist for Breath of the Wild, which is like the uh, the E3 2016 show floor gameplay, where it's like. From the very start of the game, you're on the Great Plateau, you've got 20 minutes, go do whatever you want to do. You got Horses twi- don't run into trees, and these days, we know that you could have actually finished it in that time. <laughs> yeah. um, How did they not know about wind bombing? Oh. Um, but yeah, it's like, here's, here's just the start of the game, 20 minutes, go. Um, and then, like, a week before the game came out, there was like, hey, some journalists have got to play the first five hours of the game, what are they thinking? Mm. And it was an interesting revisit, because... I think, like, the, the E3, you've got 20 minutes go previews, generally, like, really did get to the core of what that game is about. Like, the things that people were excited about in that first 20 minutes are largely the things that people who enjoy Breath of the Wild look back on fondly. It's the, there was just no training wheels, like, I, I went up some stairs, saw some light, now I'm just free to go. Uh, the game seems like it's reacting to me. There are things that look cool, but I can just ignore them and go the other way, and mm. it just lets me do that. I did meet a person who had a mission for me, but yeah. I can kind of go about it however I yeah. want. Yeah, and, like, I think a lot of, like, Nintendo did a really good job with that, not only as, like, a, a starting area of the game, but an area that, like, very quickly conveyed to people, like, I understand what the appeal of this is, having played very little of it. Mm. And I think, like... People definitely got the right idea of what that game was trying to be from its opening. Yeah. And I, I, that was interesting to see. The other one is like watching the like, hey, I've played five hours of it. Here's where I'm, I'm landing previews is kind of more interesting because like a lot of the stuff that people talk about in those previews is very much where people landed on reviews. But there's also a lot of like, you can see a lot of, like, optimism of things that didn't pan out. Uh, one of the things that's really interesting that pops up in a lot of those Was previews... Was people hoping to see dungeons? No, no, no. It's 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 more specifically uh, people going, I hope that there are... Uh, there's, like, a good variety of shields and swords that don't break by the end and that, like, eventually I'll have... And, like, things that weren't ultimately deal breakers when it came around to their review, but you see, like, the little bits of hope for things that, like... Things that people clearly were like... uh, I understand that my wooden shield and my wooden stuff will break, but I hope that eventually I will get the Halion shield and the Master Sword and that they will never break. I I hope that there is some degree of, like, permanent... uh, Some degree of my ability to get attached to things. Mm. Um, And it's interesting seeing some of the things that, like, are now things people are hoping for in Tears of the Kingdom already being in those early previews of Breath of the Wild (laughs) and, like... Seeing that thread and going, I hope Nintendo saw that thread and followed it too. Um, but yeah, it's been an interesting rewatch of like, where were people's thoughts at? Like, you know, one, one reasonable session deep into playing. Yeah. Um, what about you? You watched anything else this week? Uh, or read, another com- anything else? read another comic book. <laughs> Tell me about this other comic I book. I read, uh, Lumberjanes volume 19. Mm. 19. The penultimate episode. <gasps> See, I, 
I have read Lumberjanes for Anne Weil a good many years now. There since you I think almost certainly before we were together. Oh, oh, definitely. <laughs> um, because I think when we first moved in together, we each had a copy of Volume One. Yep, yep. Although I had a good few other episodes of uh, three volumes as well. I hadn't realised it finished in 2020. Yeah, like yeah. that. That was it. It ended. I have now finally managed to filter through to the end. And weirdly, I think because of so much like um, supernatural weirdness and um, divine intervention weirdness and portals and time travel and time compression and fantasy and gods and monsters and everything else. Oh, probably shouldn't say that. I might get sued by an energy drink. <laughs> um, I, c- I kind of wondered if it wasn't going to be like... This is the perfect excuse to have a bunch of kids who never seem to get any older and we can keep telling these stories about them forever. Like like cartoons do. Yeah, but like the vibe from the start has been it's in a setting that is very specifically about like these are good times that will have to end and yes. you'll have to be okay with the closure of this is a limited yeah. space of time. Yeah, and in fact the the, the but I don't think I was so Super weird to have thought that. No, I agree. Have you read the um, Parents' Day mm. volume or, or comic yeah. books? There's a whole section where it seems like there is some weirdness with time, or maybe it's just their perception of it. Yeah, I, 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 I don't mean to say that I think you're strange for having thought that. I think no. that like the, you, they gave you every reason to think that might be how they went. Like the, the, there might be some something different in that particular uh, degree but 19 ends with just peril Mm. there's been sort of looming threats going on in the last few volumes anyway like things that are just like yup this sort of happened and this is sort of going on in the background but don't worry we're going to go back to April wants to organise parties and Ripley wants to go and cuddle dinosaurs and all that good stuff and um yeah, it's been quite a journey, and I'm. Uh, this is something else I'm probably going to want to probably want to sit down and read straight through from the start before I get into volume twenty. Yeah, because it hit hit the last volume with momentum. Yes, uh, it is. It is. It is a chunky friend. It is sitting over there right now. I can see it from here. Yep. Because I got to the end of nineteen, I was like, I have to know what happens. <laughs> <laughs> um. But yeah. Um. It's it's still beautiful. It's still lovely. It's um. Still, friends being friends are still hecka queer, yeah. Um, and, and very, uh, very bizarre in a lot of ways. And I am curious how you end this story. Yeah. Um. Apparently, there is talk of a like a cartoon series happening, but I I don't know who's picked it up. If it's Netflix, wouldn't get too attached to it because we know it'll get cancelled after after everyone's interested. But yeah. Lumberjanes has been delightful throughout. I have very much enjoyed it, and um, I'm going to be sad to see it end. Yeah. It's all right. I can get back to the other comic book series that I started reading, haven't finished, and have recently found out has ended in my absence, and that's Unbeatable Squirrel Girl. Ah. I think that ended last year or the year before. They were just like, yeah, we we told the story we wanted to. Bye. Bye. (laughs) But, um, yeah... That, that that's some number change. What about you? Have you watched anything else? Oh, that's, anything else? that's everything I put in my eyes, I think. Well then time for this. Laura, 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 Laura. What? what? We've got a new sponsor. <gasps> Tell me about our new sponsor. Well, do you sometimes buy things? I do sometimes buy things. And have you noticed that just about every shop now has a app uh. or a card? Or and something. There's that... always the, yeah the thing that I need to have to get the rewards to get the good price, or just the thing they really want me to purchase, even if I don't want to purchase the thing. Look, they can't afford to keep running the business the way they have done. They need to sell some of your data. Yeah, and but they I... can't do that if you yeah. don't fill in the form and get the card or download yeah, the app really so that just... they can also have location yeah, and but... facial recognition. Yeah, but I really can't be bothered. And even if I did, like that's extra space on my phone I have to use up, and I don't want to. Well. This week's sponsor is upsell autocomplete.lol.net. Tell me more. 
Well, if you're tired of having to tell the staff at Gregory's that you don't want to download their reward app, or the staff at Game that you don't want to buy disc protection, this patented device will put you into a dissociative state and automate your responses to the upsell tactics in the blink of an eye. They're letting you pay for your purchases and you don't remember having to tell them no. Ah, oh, I, I go, okay, I'm ready to purchase my thing. And then the next thing I know, I'm putting my card on the thing. Yeah. And the bit in between where they try and get me to get the reward card, just, oh. No reward just, card? No 10p bag? Yeah, I just mentally zoom past it. Oh, that's great. Yeah. It's all there. Well, that is upsellautocomplete.lol.net. Enter the code QNPS25. I think we've all established that I don't know what episode we're on I mean, most we of know the time. Roughly where we're at. 250. I'm going to say nine. Might be wrong. <sighs> and you could, uh, you, you could get a discount on Upsell Autocomplete for the first 60 years. Yeah. That's upsellautocomplete.lol.net. Uh, yeah, try it today. There is a free trial. Ooh. But you will have to sign up and get the oh, you oh, bastards. Fuck, oh, fuck. Inside the boardroom of Supremacy Software. Hi. Hi. So, we got a problem. Always. Always problem. with the problems. I know Always. Problems. Do you remember when it used to be, hey, here's a bonus. Hey, yeah, I, I, we've I, got loads of money. Hey. I brought you an intern to flog. Right. It feels like all we got these days is problems. But, uh, yeah. So, you know that, uh, that new Call of Duty we're working on? I mean, we are still in business. So, yes, we are working yeah. on a, a new Call of Duty. Yeah. yeah. So, we hadn't announced it yet. And some fan, I don't know how, some fan found out about it. And they have, uh, leaked its existence to the press. Right. So, like, they've sidestepped our carefully curated, this is when we announce it for maximum hype and therefore maximum profit. Right. So, um, we, I mean, we could do the thing like that, uh, that other publisher did win, you know, their, like, TV shows got leaked. We could, you know, cancel the whole thing. Be like, nah. Yeah, but And that... then we drive the tribalism and say, it was that one. That is the reason why you don't have a new Call of Duty. Yeah, but that would mean not selling Call of Duty this year. Which, we want to sell Call of Duty to make the money. Yeah, but how about this? We keep making Call of Duty, but we tell them that we, we're we not going to do it now. Because of that, that leak leaker, leaker, right? Yeah. And then, you know, we let our fans who we have worked up into a uh a frenzy deal with the problem for us i mean we look, paint a target on that guy look, i i was simply gonna suggest we like i don't know send send some people who aren't technically cops to go like you know do a lot of shouting and banging on the doors and threatening to kill them if they didn't you know say that the leak was a lie or something Hmm. I mean, I really want to go like the heaviest of heavy handed could we maybe get like a private military corporation yeah. to well, do that. Well, I mean, look, I think as long as we're allowed to be in a car with blacked out windows, you know, watching from the sidelines, I would love to see, you know, some kid get so scared shitless by us sending a literal military organization to their door over a leak. Because, like, at that point, no one's gonna fucking dare leak shit after that. When it's like, oh, a tank rolled up to my house, guess I shouldn't have leaked Call of Duty. Yeah, there's there's us in that that uh, nice uh, Hummer that we, uh, you know, drive down to the paintball every year. Uh, and, you know, they'll uh, they'll be, like, standing on this guy's throat and it'll be, like, wheezing, why, why? And they'll be like, Rick and Chad, send the regards. Yeah. You are a fucking genius. I know. So, <gasps> what have you put in your ears? Uh, not a lot this week, but I put a couple of new mm -hmm, songs mm -hmm, in my ears. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, uh, th there's a bit of a bit of like a, a, a narrative theme, it feels like, or a tonal theme to, to the, the music I listened to this week. Okay. I listened to a song called Eat Them by Lady Pills. Uh, it, it's a sort of femme rock track that's got some sort of 80s influences to the sound about just being really fed up with men and just kind of wanting to live around fewer of them. Right. Uh, it, it's... The 80s influences to the rock sound give me vibes of, like, that very 80s bra-burning feminist energy. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, like, to just eat all the men, 
Not the dicks, though. Throw them out for the birds. Not worth it. <laughs> um, which kind of goes along with a track I was listening to called Yes, uh, yes All Cops uh, by Warriors, which is a sort of femme punk rock track about, unsurprisingly, um, pushing back against the Not All Cops narrative. And actually, yes, you're all the problem and I don't trust any of you. That's fair. Yeah. Uh, they're two tracks that feel like they, they, they go together quite well. Uh, and sandwiched in between them, I listen to uh, Hot Topic Is Not Punk Rock by MC Lars. Uh, I don't know about Lars in a while. No, but they, they came up in my, my recommended little feed. And yeah. I was like, you know what, I'll give it a listen. Um, it is a track that's like kind of shouty punk that starts off almost sounding like um, kind of gatekeepy, but like it's building to somewhere with purpose, like listing... A lot of, like, things you might find in Hot Topic as not being punk rock. So, like, it'll be like, ah, oh, that Evanescence poster's not punk rock. That this, that, and the other. And, like, some of it is more, like, commercially than others. You know, it, it's going down the list of, like, that Hello Hello Kitty bag is not punk rock. But sort of where it builds... What about Emily the Strange? Is Emily the Strange punk rock? Uh, I, I, think, I think this song would argue Emily the Strange <laughs> is not punk rock. Because uh, where it sort of builds to is this more cohesive argument about materialism and like specifically corporations selling anti-authoritarianism as an aesthetic yes and how it's not necessarily the evanescence poster for example itself that that isn't punk as much as it's the fact that a corporation is selling you that poster and you're not diying your own basically it's the bodge together your own Bodge together your punk aesthetic, don't rely on a corporation to sell you your punk aesthetic. And I'm like, eh, I feel like you. It, it achieves what it's trying to do, that song. Paint it, your own jacket. Yeah. It, it sets itself up as if it's being gatekeepy to be like, no, 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 we're not being gatekeepy. Make your own knockoff shit and like throw your own stuff together. Don't rely on the corporation to make your anti-corporate aesthetic. If you want to wear a Nirvana shirt, even though you've never listened to Nirvana, yeah, why not just get a shirt of your own and make a Nirvana shirt? Unless, you know, you are not the kind of person who is capable of doing so for one In reason or another. Indeed, and like, it's not a perfect take for sure, it's got its flaws, but like, I get what it's going for yeah. and it's like, yeah, it's an interesting track. <laughs> yes. Um, it's right up there with that time I went to Camden and there were a bunch of kids with, um, like a lot of punk, punk-esque gear, the trappings of punk, yeah. sitting on, um, uh, Camden Bridge above the lock, holding a sign that said, photos with punks, oh, one no, pound. No. I am aware of exactly what group of punks you mean, that the... <laughs> Decades later, that same group is still there. Really? Um, <laughs> just I've, much older now. I've heard some very <laughs> conflicting things about that group of people. Um, one of them I've heard, like, I've heard, like, kind of right wing stuff about, but also he, he did come along to one of the trans rights protests I organized and was, like, there giving his all, being like, hell yeah, trans rights. I don't know what to make of him. Um, this is, you, are you aware of the one with the, the, ske the skeleton tattooed onto his face? You're aware of this one? I, I know that that is a tattoo he's, that exists. He's shown up and been positive at protests, but also like, eh, I hear stories about him, he might not be great. That whole group on the bridge is like, I hear iffy stories about I didn't know it was the same group that they'd taken over the bridge. Yes, yeah. Because the... this would have been, what, like 2007, 8? Uh, some may have entered and some may have left, but like, it's... The it, core concept yes. of punks core, who hang out the on the bridge. The core concept of <laughs> that group of punks that, that hangs out on that bridge and like offers do you want to take a photo with a punk for a quid like that that has persisted that group hasn't gone away i'm glad that there is still something of camden that, that yeah. stays that isn't completely resellable yeah. on a market store yeah <laughs> um so yeah <laughs> um me yeah you what you want well, me, well, me do listen uh yeah. i uh yeah i've been just I, I, I was on, I was on a train. I was reading reading comic books. I, I needed needed to listen to music, but it needed to be familiar. So I just put on my MP, my, my phone. All the MP3s saved in my phone. Apparently, I've got eighteen gig of music in my phone, and I I don't know where that is. Well, um, uh, so I listen to basically everything I've got saved saved in my. I like that track off that album. It's bunged in this folder. Yeah, and occasionally I'll stick it on random. So we'll listen to four tracks from the Me First and the Gimme Gimme's album, uh, Are We Not Men, We Are Diva, uh, which was there. We're just going to do like 
Diva Tracks. Yeah. We we did show tunes and we did like like ballads and stuff. Mm. We did a country album. We sang in Japanese for uh, for one L uh, EP. This is us doing divas. So uh, straight up, uh, beautiful, uh, beautiful, but punk. Um, uh, karma comedian. I will survive. I love that version of I will survive. Uh, the Hollies, the air that I breathe. This is a very eclectic mix of of album uh, of tracks. Uh, Kitsune Squared, Lighten Up from the Star Road album. Uh, Jonathan Colton, First of May, which mm-hmm. is coming soon. Yeah. Uh, In the House and Heartbeat from the Twenty Eight Days Later soundtrack. Uh, My Chemical Romance, I Don't Love You, Mama, Cancer, Thank You for the Venom, Teenagers, To the End, I'm Not Okay, I Promise, Uh, Beauty and the Beats by Filthy Kicks, Uh, S-I-N-I, also by Filthy Kicks, Um, some good drum and bass with lots of violin and stuff, Um, Shadow of the Beast 4, I don't know if it's from Shadow of the Beast, or if it's just a track from Shadow of the Beast that is the fourth track. Uh, the Operation Wolf Loader from the Commodore 64 days, uh, the Xenon 2 Super Overworked Mix from the Amiga 500, mm-hmm. uh, Mayhem in Monsterland, uh, the, I think it's the Invincibility music I just randomly have on my phone. Um, uh, there's a person called Sedan who used to make drum and bass remixes of Silent Hill tracks, so I have uh, the Silent Hill 2 Promise track and the Silent Hill 4 Room of Angel drum and bass. Uh, big red ass hat. We've talked about this a lot. Oh, hat, 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 hat. Everybody doff your hat. Yeah. Uh, we like to party the Venga Boys. Oh, yes. I started listening to the, uh, the wedding mix. Basically, oh. all the tracks from, from, from our wedding mix. Yeah. Uh, Happy Home, Keep On Writing by Kimia Dawson. Uh, Mode Step and the Party Squad, Rainbow. Some good dubstep there. Tracy Chapman, Fast Car. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kids from Yesterday, My Chemical Romance. Ebony's Good by the Shaman. Or Shaman. Uh, I465, I'm blue. Da, ba, da, ba, da. Um, da, da, da. We've got bass. I can't remember who that's by. Uh, Backstreet Boys. Everybody. Yeah. Uh, Follow Me by uh, Shock One. Uh, All Star by Smash Mouth. Summertime Romance. Uh, hey DJ by Contrast. Uh, Propaganda by Contrast. Bomba. Mm. Uh, my Morphin Power Rangers theme. And <laughs> The Reason by Huber Stank. Oh. <laughs> yes, that song that you. I was like, I can tell you what that is. Yeah, I I had for the longest time uh, a re. Well, I still have a very good uh, Happy Hardcore mix that I break out every summer. Yes. And I'm always like, I or was always like, I don't know what this track is, but yes. it sounds great. We, it sounds even better in Happy Hardcore, yeah. but the original is also. Yes, we weird. had a moment at a festival last summer in the back of a van, and just I was humming along to it. You were like, "Oh, you know what this is?" Which you know? Yeah, I'm like, "Tell oh, yeah. me." I was, I was like, no. "I was like, give me a second. I definitely know this from when I was like 14 and very, <laughs> very angsty." <laughs> but yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So that is everything I listen to. <laughs> well then, <gasps> time for this. Oh, I'm so ready to have the speeds up. Ugh. Sorry? Ugh. H- hello? Oh, hello. Who are you? Who, what, who, what, who are you? I'm a smart pizza, remember? They offered you smart pizza. Hello, smart pizza here. I'm gonna be Look on... Look what I've, what have I got? I mean, what the, what, 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 what is that, is that your, that, that's your face, is it? Um... Sorry, I'm going to be honest, I kind of glazed over when ordering the pizza. I wasn't paying much attention other than, yes, pizza, please. What? What's that about my face? Uh, that's it, is it? That's, 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 ooh. You know, I mean, yeah, yeah. Just, can we get this over with so I don't have to look at it anymore? Um, I'm, I'm not sure. Did you brush your teeth? Oh, oh. I, I'm just going to close the lid and bring you back into the pizza place. Hi, um. Hello. Hi, can I get a refund on this pizza? What? Um, I mean, you've taken it outside. I mean, we really can't do anything with it now. I opened the pizza box and it started insulting my face. Well, it is a personal pizza. Yeah, yes, I know it's a personal pizza, but it's too personal. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to this test of the UK's emergency alert system. Your phone is making a loud and annoying noise. 
so you know what it will sound like in the event of an emergency. Would you like to continue receiving these loud, annoying alerts in future if there's an emergency, so you know something bad is coming? Or would you rather be blissfully unaware and avoid having a shrill alarm noise as the backdrop to your final moments? Do you know what I want to see more of? What do you want to see more of? Partial Justice Warriors. Partial Justice Warriors? Yeah. Alright Larry. Alright Larry, how are you doing? Oh, uh, you know, not, you know, I'm, I'm doing my best mate, but uh, I lost my voice over the weekend, so uh, excuse if I uh, struggle a bit today. Oh, that's alright, we'll keep it brief today, yeah. you know. Yeah. You well, that's much? Well, I've been... Uh, I've been seeing a thing happen that, you know, I've, I've known about for a while, but it's always frustrating when you see it happen. Yeah, yeah. Which is uh, bullshit around, uh, you know, people not making an effort to learn to pronounce people's names. I mean, I, I know someone called Jane who constantly gets called Janet. That's that yeah. sort of thing? Or? I mean, you know, that's basic, but you, you get this a lot with, like, you know, I'm, I'm just going to say, usually with white people uh, not being willing to learn names, you know, that are not common where they're, you know, in whatever little town they grew up in, uh, being like, oh, yeah, no, that's too hard to say, can't can't learn how to pronounce that. You know, sometimes doing the old bullshit, I'm going to call you blank instead because it's easier. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, it, it, I've known so many people over the years who have uh, had to shave down their names for other people's uh, comfort or convenience, who've got to come, come around to, like, Oh, I just tell people my name is blank because it's easier than, you know, have, having to actually teach them a name they might not know. It's just really, it's a, it's a real shame that we've got this sort of culture that's formed of, like, people unwilling to make a basic effort to, you know, respect someone's, you know, a core part of someone's identity. Yeah, it's 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 like TLDR for uh, names and general just respect. I, I I remember when I was very little, the uh, news agent my dad used to get his, his papers from every day. For the longest time, I understood that the guy who ran that place was called Dell. Yeah. I had heard the name Dell before. My parents watched Only Falls and Horses. You know, that was a name I had heard. It took me many years and, and growing up and, and going in there as a person who, you know, also frequented this place quite regularly and, and yeah, changed yeah. them to learn that the man's name was Dilip. And yeah. not Dell at all. Yeah, yeah, it's the uh, the the expectation that that you know people will shave down their name for other people's uh, comfort and convenience, and it's a real it's real disappointing how pervasive it not only is, but how much like how little it feels like it has changed. It's a real yeah. shame because like you know a person's name is pretty core to how how you know a person generally thinks about themselves and yeah. the least you can fucking do is like if you if you're not familiar with the name mate take a minute to learn it yeah you know you know i may, may maybe you're going to have to sound it out a few times get used to certain pronunciation yeah. maybe it's got an r you have to roll and you're yeah. you know you know if you're an an english speaker and but like more of an english yeah. rather than a scottish yeah. speaker maybe you don't roll your r's a lot and yeah. maybe that's just something you can work on out of respect. Well, that's the thing, you know. There might be sounds in a name that are not sounds that are common in in a, in your, your language that you have yeah. not practiced. Recognize that and go, huh? I should probably practice that one. Yeah. You know, it's the respectful thing to do. Yeah, <sighs> and uh, you know, some people don't mind if you know you maybe rush over some of the the uh, pronunciation that's you know not. The way your your mouth is, is used to working around certain uh, consonant sounds. It's making the effort. It is it? making the effort, and also not skipping straight to the oh well, I can't be bothered to to, yeah. to learn that. I'm just going to cut it down to you know whatever single syllable I can manage. Yeah. So oh yeah, your your name means something uh, you know beautiful and and and, and important, and you know your it means a, a great deal to you and your family. But, you know, we're just going to call you, you know... Uh, oh, God, I'm... Dr there, there was a couple of kids at school... Oh, Pat. There was a kid at school called Pat. I don't, to this day, remember what his full name was. But it was not that when he moved... When he when he moved to our school in middle school and did not speak a word of English. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> Fancy young mate. Yeah.
Yeah. <sighs> good luck, mate. Good luck. Good luck. All right, I think we're going to pop the kettle on. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, you know, something warm and sweet. Soothe oh, the throat. Lovely. So, Laura, <laughs> you do many things and those things are found on the internet. Whereabouts would people I find those things? things and those things are on the internet. Go check out Laura Gables pretty much everywhere on the internet. You can find all the things that I do if you do that. Uh, Twitter, Twitch, YouTube. Twi- Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, TikTok, Patreon. That's the one that pays the bills. So go check all the places. Uh, June 9th, 2023, at 4 p.m. UK, 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Pacific, check out the Access Ability Summer Showcase. Oh, shit. That's happening. Find out about a bunch of upcoming video games that have cool accessibility settings. Uh, if a game looks cool, you'll know by the end of the trailer whether it's going to be playable for you as a disabled player. Hell yeah. We've got some cool stuff to talk about. Just look forward to that. It's going to be available with audio descriptions, ASL, BSL... Uh, June 9th, look forward to it. Pencil it into your calendar for Mm -hmm. definitely not E3 week, Summer Games Fest week, whatever we call this week anymore. We call it the Accessibility Summer Showcase week. That's what we call it. That's what we call it. What about you? Where are you on the internet? Me, uh, Linktree, linktree.ee slash janiac, J-A-N-E-I-A-C. You can find music and things I've written and all sorts of things I've done. T-shirts I've designed... Like the vest that I am wearing today, which has the uh, Jungle Skog uh, IKEA bear, and it says Junglist Movement on it. Because I'm an aging music nerd <laughs> and a lover of big squishy <laughs> dumpy bears. But most important one is patreon.com slash stoned monkey radio for as little as a dollar a month. You can help me justify 76 hour work week. You can join 29 other lovely people and help me get to 30 Patreon backers and heck, we might even be able to hit 50 by the end of the year. I would super. Super like that. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much everything I do. So, Laura. <gasps> yes? Will you sing us out, please, darling? Until next time, be a stranger.